everyone. I'm so happy you could make it. Uh, my name's Cassandra Beach from Schuler Books and Nicola's Books, and this is Alana Haley. Hello. <laughs> and I wanted to thank you all for joining us virtually for an evening with Deborah Royce in conversation with Wendy Walker. Before we get started, I'd just love to share a couple things with you. Um, over this pandemic, we have produced 350 plus virtual events, and we are proud to have the opportunity to keep our programming in motion as we've navigated these ever changing times. Uh, such an example of one of these is tonight, and we are pleased to have you with us. This uh, event tonight features Deborah Royce in conversation with Wendy Walker as they discuss Royce's newest novel, Ruby Falls, which was released last May but came out in paperback earlier this month. It is the story of a young actress with a secret, her new husband that she barely knows, and the growing suspicion that secrets he harbors might be more intense than her own. Um, this is Ruby Falls is Royce's second novel, and it has won the Zibby Award for the best plot twist in 2021. Um, Deborah Goodrich Royce made her debut as an author in 2019 with the book Finding Mrs. Ford. Um, Royce was actually an actress in film and TV for 10 years, which we were just talking about before everyone joined us, and um, is remembered by the soap opera fans for her role of Silver Kane, sister of legendary Erica Kane on All My Children. She later worked as a story editor for Miramax Films and was instrumental in the development of such films such as Emma, The Englishman Who Went Up the Hill But Came Down a Mountain, and A Wrinkle in Time. And with her husband, she has restored and reopened the Avon Film Center, a 1939 landmark in Connecticut, which now operates as a nonprofit dedicated to independent, classic, foreign, and documentary films. Wendy Walker, pleased to introduce is the author of psychological suspense novels as well including all is not forgotten emma in the night the night before don't look for me an american girl her novels have top bestseller lists both nationally and abroad and have been optioned for both television and film Wendy holds degrees from Brown University and Georgetown Law School and has worked in finance and several areas of the law. And as a former family law attorney with training in child advocacy, Wendy draws from her knowledge of trauma and psychology to write compelling complex characters and stories. So if you still need a copy of Ruby Falls and wish to support Schuler Books or Nicholas Books, I just wanna reference you to the link in the chat um, that will bring you to the website right to the link. And if you are a Michigan local, please stop by to our brick and mortar locations um, in Grand Rapids or Okemos or Nicholas Books is in Ann Arbor. Um, so it's right there in the chat and we are about to begin. So if you have a question, go ahead and ask away in the question and answer and we will save them to the end. Um, and this goes without saying, but please remember to be respectful and mindful with your questions. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Deborah Royce and Wendy Walker. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. <clears throat> I am glad to be kind of home in my home state of Michigan. I'm kind of there, virtually there. Hi, Wendy. Hi, it's so good to see you virtually as well. <laughs> We're actually not that far apart geographically. I We're know. not in the same room. Yeah, no, that would have been fun, actually. We'll have to think about that next time. So, um, so they've stolen a little bit of my thunder and talking about all of your amazing accomplishments, but I want to dive in a little bit deeper to the book and the the you know the the premise and the setup so but i'm going to let you do that because i don't want to give anything away because it it truly is the best plot twist that i've read and i i don't even know when i mean it's it it's not just that it surprised me but it just was so clever as well and um and it's just you know it's one of those twists where you know something's coming 
and you you just don't even try to figure it out because you know it's going to be so good and fun and satisfying and it really is so i'm going to let you give the setup um for the book so everyone kind of knows what it's about and then i want to talk a little bit more about some of the aspects of it okay well first <clears throat> i want to give you a really great edit that my editor gave me about that particular plot twist and i i've kept this in mind ever since she said, generally speaking, modern readers don't want Agatha Christie where it's kind of a, you know, this locked room mystery and you go through the whole book. And in the end, the detective walks in and says, what well, was the butler you met on page four? And it would have been impossible <clears throat> for you to ever figure out it was the butler you met on page four. She said, I want you to think more about the movie, The Sixth sense. And if you remember the sixth sense, when you get to the point in the movie, and I won't spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but you get to the point in the movie, you realize what's going on. She said, you will not have figured it out beforehand. But when you get to that point in the movie, they go back visually and show you the breadcrumb trail. She said, <clears throat> you won't do that in a book, but you want the reader who will not have figured it out, but getting to that point, you want the reader to think, oh, that's what that meant and that meant and that meant. So I think that was an overarchingly wonderful edit that stands the test of time. So Ruby Falls, it begins, at, I, I'm from Michigan and I have a father, had a father, he's deceased from the South, from the state of Tennessee. So Ruby Falls begins in a cave in Tennessee by that name where a little girl named Ruby at the age of six in 1968 is taken by her father and they have turned off the lights as, as is my memory of Ruby Falls. And she can hear the waterfall roaring, but because it's a cave, the sound is all around her. She can't tell where it's coming from and she is scared witless and she's trying very hard not to move and not to fall in the water and not to be afraid when her father lets go of her hand and the lights come back on and he's gone and it's 1968 and the tour guides are looking at her and they don't remember who she came in they know she didn't come in alone obviously she's a child but 68 there are no cell phone records no credit card records no hidden cameras. So they take her up to the gift shop, plop her down on a, vent, a bench, no one gets her, they call the police. She's held at the police station until her mother calls later that night. And you know they match up the child and the mother and the daughter from Michigan are grounded in Chattanooga, Tennessee for the rest of the summer. The mother is dealing with the police inquisition and the search for the child. And the child is in a state of what we would now call PTSD. 20 years later, when you next meet her, she's a young actress. Uh, I neglected to say that her name is Ruby, which is very much a double entendre, Ruby Falling at Ruby Falls. And she's ditched her middle name, Ruby. She goes by Eleanor Russell. She's an actress on a soap opera. <laughs> Where did I get that? Really? And she's been written out of her show, which is called The Finger of Fate. So she hightails it for Europe where she meets a tall, dark, handsome stranger named Orlando Montague. And she marries him without knowing him. And when they are about to go in the catacombs uh, at, in Rome as a little tourist visit, she has an attack of claustrophobia, can't go in, knows she should tell her brand new husband about this thing that happened to her as a child. But of course she doesn't do it because the book would be over right then. The last little snippet I'll give, they move to LA, they start a new life in this perfect cottage in the Hollywood Hills. She is cast in a remake of Rebecca, uh, the Hitchcock film, the Daphne du Maurier book. And as she begins this role, Orlando starts to change and he, uh, is not as pleasant as he used to be. And he's a little snappish. And the penny starts to drop with Eleanor that he may have a secret or two of his own. So that is the framework uh, that starts the book. 
<clears throat> yeah, and it's um, I love that it is set in these time frames because you don't, when you're reading it, you don't get the sense that it's like a historical fiction novel or anything like that. There's not, um, it's not about the 1980s or the 1960s. It's just that setting it in those time frames enables you to sort of, like you said, get rid of some of the uh, means of communication and detection and, and keeping track of people that we have now and that make you know, plots so difficult to get around. We always have to have the cell phone die or the cell phone be lost, or why didn't they take a video or why can't she just Google him and find out the truth about him? And so 1987, there's no Googling, you know, her new husband to find out what's really going on. No, and the other thing there, because it, um, it was optioned by someone in Hollywood and they asked me how I would feel about bringing it into the modern era. And one of the things with Eleanor slash Ruby, because of this crazy disappearance of her father, she becomes obsessed with finding out what happened to him. Did he die? Was he taken? You know, it was the sixties. She fixates on her own name, Ruby. And the one conspiracy of the 1960s that really stands out is the Kennedy assassination. So this ruminates in her mind and she does all this research. And I think if you made it contemporary and you had a heroine who was a conspiracy theorist, you'd have a very different kettle of fish. You would have a character spending all of her time, you know, on the internet, just typing madly because there are people who do that. So I think having it set you know, the period she's fixated with is are the 1960s and she's she has to go to libraries and stuff. So it's it's a little more manageable. Yeah. And and it's and it's, you know, the the human dynamics are still the same. And that's what is so brilliant about it is that you don't feel like you're in the 1980s. There's not you know, it's not a period piece, although I can't believe I have to say that now <laughs> since that was when I was a young adult. But but the you know the human dynamics are the same so she comes back and she starts having you know these issues in the workplace and she starts having these issues these self doubts and she's now wondering about her husband and it's the same emotions we would be having today if these events were happening the way he treats her it's not that she finds something on his cell phone it's just the way he is and the way mm -hmm. he's behaving and those things are the same now. It's it's um, and so I love that about the book. Um, what um, so he's an art dealer, and I was so curious about that. Why? Um, I mean, it's it's a great profession to give him to be mysterious and mm -hmm. have secrets. Did you was that something that you sort of knew about already, or did you have to do research into that? Where where did that idea come from? So I'm fascinated with the art world. I love art. I have some friends in the art business. My daughter was in the art business. She was at Sotheby's. She was at Pace Galleries. But I have a, a very dear friend whose husband is an art restorer. Mm -hmm. And that is a very particular, that is not what uh, Orlando is. He's a, a dealer. But in the art restoration world, you know, I've always been intrigued with some of the things he deals with. He deals with everything. He, he restores paintings. His name is Lansing Moore. He, he runs a place called Center Art Studios. If anybody needs restoration, I'll give him a plug. Uh, and he, he just, he'll deal with furniture. He'll deal with porcelains. He'll deal with, uh, you know, bronzes or paintings, you know, whether they're watercolors or oils, everything. And I got very interested in furniture. So I did a lot of research about furniture. Our heroine inherits a secretary, you know, a beautiful old tall desk from the early American period. All of those pieces of furniture had secret compartments because people did not have safes at home. They didn't have safe deposit boxes at their banks. They had to put things somewhere, their valuables. So generally speaking, they were in different places in the secretary. 
Orlando deals with Asian art. So I went down a research rabbit hole about secret compartments in uh, Asian furniture. So he, he sells a, something called a, a karakuri, um, <clears throat> I don't even know what it's, a chest, I think. So yeah, I just thought that was an interesting puzzle within a puzzle. Uh, she inherits this piece of furniture and her husband is very interested in whether or not it has secret compartments. Yeah, it was it was really interesting to have that backdrop and um, and it just made him so susceptible to all of her suspicions. Um, and there are also there's also a cat that I mean, there's so many so many components of her life that are mysterious, but then also ordinary. And one of the biggest, um, you know, uh, sort of plot um, uh, things is the, is the acting, right? So she's, this is, I, I kept waiting to see where that was going, how that was going to tie in. And, um, and I, I'm so curious um, what it was like and I get this question a lot, like, oh, you know, you wrote about this, you wrote about that. Is that based on your life or did you purposefully make it different from your life? Um, so much of this book seems to be drawn from, from your own experience. And did you do that? At, was it, um, you know, sometimes we, we live things and we're like, oh my gosh, these would make great parts of a book. And sometimes we're just dying to write about these experiences that we've had. And so we construct a book that includes them. So how did, how did this premise evolve in a way that includes all of these aspects of your life from Michigan to Tennessee and, and of course the acting? Well, the first two chapters of the book really just downloaded, which was a very unusual experience. It hasn't happened to me before and it hasn't happened to me since the chapter where she's abandoned in the cave and the chapter in Rome with the catacombs. And I, I had been really uh, doing some notes on a different book and I thought, well, this is so odd. Where did this come from? But I always think you should probably pay attention to something that's that um, powerful. I have been to Ruby Falls. I went with my parents. They did not leave me there, which was a really good thing, but it did scare me. And then the Los Angeles component. I write about a year before I started this book, I went back to LA and I hadn't been there for many years. And I had had this wonderful life there as a young actress, both before I was married and after I was married with small children. And in the years since I left LA in between when I really returned, four different friends died at different times. So going back to Los Angeles felt a little bit like a haunted place. I felt like there were such strong memories of these very special people to me everywhere I looked. And I always say to people, you know, if you live in one place for a long time, continuously, you may have had a series of traumas at a series of places, but you don't, every time you drive by the CVS, if you drive by it five times a day, you're not looking at it thinking, oh my God, that's where John broke up with me. You kind of get on with that. Going back to a place though, after so long away, I was having those experiences. I drove down the street with my daughter and I was like, oh, look, Tess, theirs was your pediatrician. She's like, yeah, mom. So the first, the book takes its inspiration from the setup of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. It's not a, a retelling of it, but it use, uses many of the opening structures. So the first line in Rebecca is, last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. And that is a line, it, it does make this, this place, this house, Manderley, this estate sound a little spooky, a little otherworldly. You, I mean, you know right away that the person who's speaking isn't there, can't be there, why not? So it evokes many things. So Hollywood, I believe, evokes a lot of feelings in many people because we've all been watching American movies for over a hundred years now. It is in the DNA of the world. We know what it looks like. Uh, so I thought 
it was such a perfect place to create this dreamlike setting. And of course, what's more dreamlike than the art of cinema? So the houses in the Hollywood Hills, I went back, I, I picked a house I used to live in, which is no longer there. I had a crazy cat lady across the street. Her name was Kathy and I just loved her. So I kind of picked those little snippets. My first studio in, in Los Angeles was Paramount. Paramount Pictures flew me out there to screen test for and then shoot a pilot with Christopher Lloyd, if you remember him, Back to the Future, the you know, white haired guy. So it evoked so many things for me that I felt were a perfect dovetail for the mood that I wanted to create because this is a psychological thriller, but it also was a gothic thriller. It has those kind of eerie, veering on the edge of supernatural feelings. It isn't supernatural the way a lot of um, modern day Gothic is, but it, it's like a Victorian Gothic where you're teetering on the edge of, like Jane Eyre, what's going on? What are the noises in the house? Yeah, and you know that you are deeply inside the mind of Ruby or Eleanor. And, and so you do have that feeling um, that it is, that you are, it is, it is truly a psychological study of her. You are in her mind. You are walking alongside her as she is having thoughts. And she's not really concerned with telling you her story. You're, she's just relaying her experiences to you. And so you do get this feeling of being almost a voyeur inside her mind. And it's, it's a really, um, it's, a, it's just, it, it creates a certain mood. You're right. Like mm. It definitely creates a mood. You're not, um, it's a very, it's a very moody book when you are, when you're with her, you know, and you know that, that something's going to go off the rails or that you just <laughs> not sure why, and you know, this twist is coming. So just yeah. switching to that aspect of it, as you were writing her, um, did you like, first of all, how did, how, did you have to do any research into psychology or, you know, the, the impact of PTSD and, you know, to try to figure out, you know, who she is or um, did she just come organically to you? Because the whole book really is inside her head. Right, well, it was both. So like I said, the whole, the first two chapters came organically. So I knew that it, it began with that childhood trauma. And it was a very profound childhood trauma to be completely alone in this dark underground space I mean, to me, it feels like being buried alive. And I, around that time, I had heard someone talking about sexual assault. And the phrase, the way that they phrased it was so chilling, it made a huge impact on me. They said, um, in, in a sexual assault from a man to a woman, the woman is forever changed for the rest of her life by this experience where all he was doing was scratching an itch. And it just made my flesh crawl, this idea that here we are human beings having an experience together and the order of magnitude is, could not be farther apart. And I think so many of our stories are like that, the things that we feel undone by that happened to us as children, our parents might not even remember. The things that we've done for children, they might not remember. So, you know, we're all living in different realities. So I did read a lot about it. Um, so there was the organic component and then this, I mean, coming to understand, for her, that was really the seminal event of her life. And I wanted to look into how people hold themselves together after something like that. And are they sort of holding themselves together with white knuckles, 
is it is it a paper thin veneer of um, what's composing them? And I think you know it it could be any and everything. I, I think there are different degrees of resilience among us. Um, I was watching years ago. There was a girl who was paddling her surfboard in Hawaii, and a shark mm. uh, took her arm. And this girl was at that age of puberty, 12, 13 years old, and she was fine and she was unselfconscious. And I thought, boy, if you could bottle what that girl has, because very often we women, you know, at that moment of puberty, you think about that book, Reviving Ophelia, we go from being the subject of our own lives, you know, the observer of the world to becoming the object for somebody else. Do you think I'm pretty? Do you think I'm valuable? And looking at that girl, I know I've gone very far afield, but we're talking about psychology. That particular girl who lost her arm, what did she have that enabled her to absolutely transcend and not care how she looked? So I, I am very intrigued by all of those things. Yeah, and it's um, it, PTSD is such a hot topic now, especially with COVID and seeing, you know, the um, the impact of um, ongoing low grade trauma, in a sense, um, of just the disruption of life, and of course now there, you know, there are studies about generational trauma and how the trauma of one generation can actually impact, um, you know, the psychological makeup of future generations. So it's really a hot topic, and and I, and you know, anyone interested in reading a book that is, you know, a deep dive into one person's experience with PTSD, this is really it. I mean, it's really amazing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your writing process, and because a book like this. Um, and I just did, it's, I just finished edits today on, on a manuscript and it's so, in, yeah, I know, <laughs> we'll see, but, um, I'm sure there'll be more rounds, but you know what it's like when you are trying to piece together a complicated plot, especially one that's written, you know, in the head of a character, you don't want to be inconsistent. You have to try to keep, you know, all of the facts and all of the, the disclosures in, you know, in place. And um, in some ways, you know, it, it can be um, difficult to do if it's, if you're not completely immersed in it. So what, what is your writing process? Do you just dive into a book and bang out a manuscript and, and, you know, a couple of weeks and become fully immersed in it? Or can you sort of, you know, go back to it um, now and again and, and, and be right there with it? Well, I do parallel processes. I write notes. And when I get to a certain point with the notes and my notes aren't exactly an outline, they're more, uh, I start with notes like, well, what if this? And what if that? And what if this? And then there she goes here. And then it well, could be this, it could be that. And I just put that all down. I write typing, I write faster typing. I don't write longhand. Um, so the thing I'm working on now, I probably have five pages of notes. And I then at a certain point, I start writing. So I, I am at that early stage. So I have about three chapters written. And then, so it's both are short, my pages of notes and my pages of writing. So when I sit down tomorrow, I'll review both. And as I'm writing, if I start changing things, I'll make, handwritten notes. So another component of my notes is I'll do a timeline. Timelines are very important in thrillers because you might have this cup is yeah. the thing that hits somebody over the head. And there's got to be a moment when you see it. And there's got to be a, another moment where you don't see it. And you never, if, if you're non-linear, if the book is jumping around in time, you never want the cup to be visible before it's supposed to be or after it's not supposed to be. So timelines help. Uh, another thing I do, and I have done because I write often in different time periods, I like to go back and forth. You can go online 
and print out a calendar page mm. of you know July 1979. So you can see where uh, the first was on a Sunday or it was on a Wednesday or whatever. You can look up all that stuff. So you just kind of want that stuff to be precise. And then if I, let's say I'm working in a five month period in 1979, I'll print out those five months. And I'll also make pencil notes in the date square. You know, these are those, you yeah. know what they are. So um, that helps me cross-reference myself in different ways. So I'm not a full outliner. I do believe there are many people who outline the entirety of their book and then they just fill in the color. I don't do that, but I have this kind of back and forth thing going on. It's so interesting how every writer has a different process. Mm -hmm. And just today reading through, today and yesterday reading through this manuscript that was one of my one of my tasks was to, I have two, I have two um, a split time frame going on. And I had, so I, I had the, you know, the sort of these timelines I was writing, okay, then two days. I think every time time is mentioned, two days pass in this timeline when up here, these events are here. I mean, it was, it really becomes a maze. So I love that idea of a calendar. That calendar thing really helped me enormously with Finding Mrs. Ford that takes place in Rhode Island and in Michigan in 1979, in 2014, it goes back and forth, it comes to a crescendo, and then it goes back and forth again. So, you know, if this cup is, you know, in the first back and forth is here, when you do it again, you've got to make sure. And so that, that calendar thing, yeah. And they're just loose pages with your pencil notes. And you just, it, it does help a lot with that very particular problem. Yeah, no, that's amazing. That sounds like, like a metaphor for my life. Loose, loose pages with pencil <laughs> marks. <laughs> I know, like, that, that could be your <laughs> memoir. <laughs> my whole life, loose pages and pencil marks. Oh my right. God. Um, <laughs> How do you, how do you, well, how did you start writing? So you've had this incredibly interesting life as an actress. And then I absolutely, by the way, love, love, love that you before, like now actresses are all getting into producing, directing, writing, all that stuff. They're doing, you know, they're starting to do that now. But when you were an actress, that was really pretty new. I mean, you were, uh, you were ahead of your time in sort of branching out into the production side and, um, and getting, you know, behind uh, on the other side of the camera and uh, kind of showing your chops as a, as a producer. And I think that's really, so how, what prompted that? And then how did you move from that um, into writing novels? Did you write screenplays along the way or did you experience so many scripts that you were like, you know, be, started sort of falling in love with storytelling? What was the progression there? So <clears throat> I think it helped that I went to college and had a college degree. As our mothers always tell us, it's very good to have something to fall back on. So I could read and write, you know, I'm yeah. saying that kind of jokingly, but I could read and write. And acting was kind of a fluke that I decided to try and then had some success with it. I came to New York to dance. I had been cast in a movie with Frank Langella and Tom Hulse as a dancer uh, in, where I was in college near Cleveland. And I went on to New York to audition for that choreographer and spent about a year pursuing dance. Just, I've always had this ability to kind of reassess. I, I, so I think that's a healthy thing. And after a year of pursuing dance, I thought I'm just not good enough. <clears throat> I'll give acting a whirl. And I had a really great 10 year run as an actress. Toward the end of those 10 years, I was married and I had two children and acting was losing its enchantment, if you will. I was living in LA. This was pre, you know, very few people had a home computer, you know, nobody was emailing you a script. So at six o'clock, you know, you're a mom, 
uh, with, with two little babies, uh, a one-year-old and a four-year-old, I would get a call to drive an hour to pick up a script, an hour there and an hour back. That's not a lot of fun at six o'clock in the evening with little ones. <clears throat> so I was thinking, here I am, I'm at this stage in life. Now I was about 30, early 30s. And I thought, I, I'm putting all this energy into killing myself to get a movie or a TV show that I actually wouldn't pay money to go see. So something is wrong with this picture. At this time, it, it's now the early 90s, we had the opportunity to move to Paris where my husband had grown up, my first husband. And in Paris, I was hired by a French film studio as a reader. All film studios have readers on the payroll, freelance readers. You read the screenplay or the novel, you synopsize it for the studio heads, and you do a page of notes. Um, <clears throat> you know, what works with story and character and arc and all that stuff. So that was transition pivot point number one. We came back to the States uh, after a couple of years. My first husband was hired by the actress Julia Roberts to run her development company at Disney. And I was hired by Harvey Weinstein as the story editor at Miramax. And I do pause at this point uh, to say that I ha had an extraordinary exper experience at Miramax. And for me, uh, I certainly didn't know about anyone's extracurricular activities. I was not involved in any of that. And uh, it was a huge opportunity as a former actress. And so the years I was at Miramax, I think of as my writing school, just having that, that deep chance to really think in, in an editorial capacity of other people's writing. And it was screenplays. And after I left Miramax, because the workload was just so uh, onerous with two small children, I did write a screenplay with a writing partner. I got a grant for this screenplay, but life changed. My first husband you know, had a midlife crisis. He left the marriage, everything got kind of crazy. And then by the time I remarried and moved to Connecticut, um, I joined a couple of writing groups and I was secretly quietly writing in the closet on nothing of long duration, short stories, things like that. And there, one of our projects was the restoration of this cinema in Stanford. And in my work at the Avon, this cinema, um, I developed a close friendship with Gene Wilder, who in addition to being a, one of the, our best comedic actors of all times was also a writer. So we had this email relationship and he said to me at one point, are you a writer? I think you're a writer. So he asked to read something. I showed him some work and he became a huge encourager of my writing. And I think as I was going along in these writing groups, which I would very much advise people who are kind of writing in the closet the way I was, if you can find a writing group, it's a great exercise because not that you do things for other people, you really are writing for yourself, but it helps you understand what it is about your own voice that is unique and that people understand. So for me, the, this moment where it was go left or right was 2014. My youngest child was off on her own. And I thought, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. So from 2014 to now, um, that's been the journey. My third book will come out in January and that's where we are. That's amazing. What I, I love writers' stories and yours is unique and um, and I love the pivots. I mean, this is really, so many, so many writers have pivoted from other things into writing because writing is truly one of those endeavors where there is no, there's no set path. There's no, there's there are tons of barriers to entry but also none right so um you can write a brilliant novel at 20 right at right out of college at 21 22 and you know and your career is off and running or you can you know write 10 novels and it's the 11th that gets published and you're you know in your 50s or you can do a million other things and then eventually find your way 
to expressing yourself through um, through novels. So I love that you've done that and we are all the beneficiaries of your journey and um, and your work be, uh, because Ruby Falls is really just an exceptional, exceptional novel and everyone should order it. They should go to the link right now and at Schuler Books and order the paperback. And with that, I know we need to um, we need to wrap up and, and leave questions um, that may have come in. So I'm, I'm going to pass the baton over. Thank you, Wendy. To our lovely host. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wendy and Deborah. That was amazing. We were just sitting here like, oh my gosh, she's had the most interesting life. <laughs> um, yeah, so no questions have come in through our Q&A. We have a little bit of shyness, but I know that I'm dying to know what are you both reading right now? What are you excited about? Oh boy, um, I, <clears throat> I'm actually, not reading anything because I'm writing. So I am toggling between two novels. One, well, one novel that I just did a revision on and, um, and I am working on a fully scripted piece um, for Audible, which will be about a three hour listen. So I'm waiting for edits on that. Um, and that that's really been, um, uh, it's really a unique experience because it's um, it, it's it's a new, imagine telling a story and Deborah you'll appreciate this having you know read all the so many scripts and really started your storytelling as as a script um, uh, you know reader to tell a story with no action and no internal thoughts or narration just dialogue and sound. Wow. and like an old-fashioned radio play and um oh, yeah I'm a huge fan of that by the way old yeah it's plays. they're really interesting and and you know people love podcasts and they're really loving audiobooks and so now creating content that is meant to be listened to first and foremost is interesting so I have not been reading much, but I usually read a lot of thrillers because I blurb a lot of thrillers. And um, so I, I've, I usually have a stack on my desk. Um, so I will be getting to that, to those <laughs> when I'm done with my edits. What about you, Deborah? What do you read? You read every Friday. You do, you do a wonderful series on Instagram. Everyone should follow her on Instagram because every Friday you review and talk about a book. Most Fridays, most, Fridays. most, I don't quite manage every Friday. And that's something I started really in the pandemic when I had much more time. So of late, uh, a couple of things I've read that I have or will talk about. One is a book called The Cicada Tree by a writer named Robert Gwaltney. And we had done, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pulpwood Queens. It's a big like nationwide book club. And we had done the Pulpwood Queens Conference and it's a really beautiful Southern Gothic book. And I, I just loved it. And I read Kimberly Bell's book last week, My Darling Husband, because I too read a lot of thrillers and she really, she really nails this, um, she nails a ticking clock. She's, um, it's one of those situations where, and it's not a spoiler, there's a, a home invasion in a house in Atlanta and everything is playing out with, by the minutes, talk about getting your timeline right. I wanna know how she got that right. Uh, so those are two lately. And I'm also reading Annabelle Monahan's book, uh, which is called Nora Goes Off Script about a romance writer whose husband leaves her. And uh, then she writes a very dark screenplay after that, not, not her typical romance, you know, Hallmark Channel stuff. So I read very broadly. I read mostly fiction. I read some nonfiction, but mostly fiction. Yeah. So um, you, what strikes me listening to you is that um, you have been a storyteller in many different ways. Um, you know, dance tells a story. Acting is storytelling. 
Um, you were behind the scenes doing storytelling and now you're writing, which is obviously storytelling. So um, what do you think it is about maybe your, your early life or that led you to a lifetime of storytelling and then maybe um, what, what one of those storytelling ways was your favorite? Hmm. If, if well, you have a favorite. I, I was an only child and, uh, and, and you know, pre-modern technology. So I read, 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 read. I would even, you know, have hours. We had this old set of encyclopedia from years before I was born, from the 1940s. And I would read these old encyclopedia that I just found fascinating. So I lived in my head a lot. I always liked the story. I think anything is better with a story. I think in many ways, and, and Wendy, I'd love to know if you agree with this. I often think you can really cut to deeper truths through fiction because you're not so inundated with all the details of facts. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, because I write a lot about um, trauma and um, a lot of, I put my characters through a lot of bad things that then, you know, they're then dealing with. And yes, when you, when you can try to get to the truth of what it's like to live through an event or, or of a psychological, um, you know, disposition, you can create uh, the structure for it to really examine it. Um, and everyone's truth in reality is a little bit different because everyone's, you know, as you were saying earlier, everyone's factual background is a little bit different, but you're right. And in, in fiction, you can cut to the chase, right? You can go right to the heart of what you want to be um, discussing. If you want, if you want to examine, you know, what an affair does to a marriage, for example, you can cut out what might complicate it in other in a, in a real situation like, oh, well, they, you know, there was a rocky patch or there was this or there was that. You can, you can create a pure set of circumstances that just looks at what that one, one event did to mm -hmm. a marriage. And so, yeah, you, in that way, you can unmuddy the waters of, of whatever you want and get and really examine um, those, those, um, those, those, sort of realities. So yeah, I think it's fascinating. If I can say something about that, the, I have a book called Reef Road that's coming out in January that I, I began writing in the early days of the pandemic and it's set in those early days, but it really deals with a writer researching the murder of her mother's best friend. And it came out of my research of the murder of my mother's best friend, which happened in Pittsburgh in 1948. And it was a savagely gruesome murder and it's unsolved to this day. And you talked about generational trauma, Wendy. It had a, a big effect on my mother and it's had an effect on me. And when this, this lockdown happened and I began all this research, I, I realized, you know, there's a treasure trove now of stuff on the internet. So I know a lot about this murder, but I didn't want to write it in nonfiction. I didn't want to really, you know, stick to what newspaper said what. And I also didn't want to accuse the person they think did it in real life. I didn't want to get into that. So I have fictionalized it and I've said to my mother, you know, listen, mom, the writer and her mom are a lot less balanced than you and I are. So please don't be offended. <laughs> so we'll see how she feels about that. Yeah, no, I think it's, I've taken um, a lot of, I mean, one of the beautiful things about telling a story and being a writer, I think is that you can take from your own experiences um, and try to tease out which parts are, um, are sort of universally human and not just your own story and then weave them into a fictional story that makes it accessible to a wider audience. So it's not just my story, this happened to me. It's what if this happened to you? Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Well, we are really excited about some of these upcoming projects that you guys have mentioned. Yes. My TBR pile has grown <laughs> since we've been listening. Um, if if our viewers tonight want to keep in touch or know more about what's coming up with these projects, where is the best way for them to follow it? What social media channels? I know we heard a little bit about your Instagram, Deborah, but... Definitely Instagram is my primary social media where, and then I have a website, which is my name, DeborahGoodrichRoyce.com. But Instagram is, I think, the most fun one. What about you, Wendy? Same. I'm mostly on Instagram and it's uh, Wendy Walker author. And then my website is Wendy Walker books. I don't know why I didn't keep it the same. But <laughs> anyway, um, it's Wendy Walker books is my, is my website. And that has, you know, all of my, um, you know, books and everything about them. But Instagram is, I think, really the platform that, um, that I use. And actually anyone interested in books, there is a huge um, Instagram um, sort of book community there, reviewers and bloggers and authors who share a lot. And so if you're interested in reading and learning about authors and sort of being inside that world, just start following some of your favorite authors and then, you know, seeing where it leads you because um, it's really interesting. And it also, Instagram, I find, seems like a very generally warm hearted world where people are predisposed to say nice things. I, you sometimes hear about people getting in squabbles on Twitter or Facebook, and I use those platforms as well. But I think with Instagram, everyone's pretty nice. <laughs> we love that. It's good. We like nice. Nice is good. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much again for taking um, time out of your schedule to join us. Um, and thank you to Post Hill Press for sending the event this way. We hope one day we can have you in our stores signing books. Um, it seems like it's just within reach. So we'll see how it goes, but I'm happy we got to do this virtual event this evening. Um, just a reminder, if um, any of the viewers would like to see um, or ha haven't purchased a copy yet, take a look in the chat. There's a couple links where you can get a copy of Ruby Falls. And um, we can also ship worldwide. So that is an option through both of our websites. Um, it's, and there's more information on other upcoming author events on um, our websites as on schulerbooks.com and nicholasbooks.com as well. Um, and then if you wanna follow Schuler Books, you can follow us on social media channels like Facebook, Instagram, and lately we've been really rocking it on TikTok as well. So we have some speed recommendations and other fun recommendations too. <laughs> All right. Thank you both again. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Nice. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you viewers. Yes. Yes, thank you viewers. Thank you for joining us.